Well, when I joined the Chipko movement, which was started by the peasant women of my region, who basically said, you will have to kill us before you kill the tree. And that's why the action of hugging, to protect the tree. Um, because they said the forests give us everything. They give us the water, they give us the fuel, they give us the fodder, they give us the food because the fertilizer from the forest is what created manure in the fields, which are all organic. Um, they give us our medicine. Uh, they give us our spiritual roots. These are our mother goddesses and your destruction of these forests is leading to landslides. We're having to walk longer for water. So they knew exactly the science of ecological destruction. At that time, the biggest forces seemed to be government and that too at the regional level. There was nothing bigger than that. The federal government didn't interfere. There were no global corporations. And so the highest power were local contractors, local government, and dealing with them was the strongest movement, and we dealt with it. And in 1981, the forests were protected, and logging was banned in the higher Himalaya for ecological reasons. There was no way at that point I could have imagined that 30 years later, the world would have become A, as commercially integrated, and therefore spiritually and culturally fragmented as, as it has become, that uh, human beings could start to get as brutalized as they've been, both those who are victims of this very exploitative system, as well as those who perpetrate it, because you have to be br brutalized in order to try and accumulate other people's share of resources. And of course, uh, there was no way to imagine that the political instability, economic instability that we are watching at national level, country after country, Greece, Ireland, Spain, Italy, Portugal, America, which continues to pretend it's fine, but is also highly unstable. Um, no, the, the strongest imagination couldn't have taken me there. Five hundred years ago, um, European kings and queens thought we can send out our merchant adventurers, uh, a rise in a very fundamentalist religious thought um, was used to justify this conquest, the 1492 papal bull, and uh, pirates were sent all over the world, and it was justified in the name of Civiliz civil civilizing the uncivilized. Um, and the papal bull said, go out and conquer lands that are not ruled by white Christian princes. Uh, so of course the whites were only in Europe, everything else was non-white, and that meant all of the world. Um, what's happening today is a recolonization in a number of ways. Just as that colonization was driven by power and violence and greed, Today's colonization is driven by power, violence, and greed. There was a legal, juridical concept created to justify it all. It was called terra nullius, the empty earth, the empty land. Wherever you went, if there were human beings, just deny their humanity. The aboriginals of Australia are not aboriginals. The Indians are not really fully Indians. They're more like dogs. And the, the books of that time in the first colonialism, where actually Indians are shown with heads of dogs. Um, and because we did yoga and we did all these things, then obviously we just couldn't be normal human beings. Uh, there was something very twisted about us. Um, today, the, both the empty earth in terms of land, but also empty life in terms of biodiversity living resources are being colonized. And one reason I started the movement Navdanya in 1987, was that's the time, just fortunately, I was invited to a meeting on biotechnology, the new emerging technologies to modify living resources. And the entire chemical industry, which was becoming the life sciences industry, as they call themselves, uh, talked about how uh, they had to create a whole new system through patenting, which is ownership of life, 
And to do that, they had to do genetic engineering to claim they're now inventors and creators of new life. And third, they had to remove any restriction in terms of markets, investment, laws. And they had shaped then what was called the Uruguay Round of GATT, which became the World Trade Organization. They wrote the laws. As they've said, we were the patient, the diagnostician, and physician all went in one. We uh, defined a problem, and their problem was that farmers were saving seed. Now, to me, having spent my life in childhood with biodiversity, with my parents, my early youth as a student with Chipko, defending biodiversity, to later in life be told this biodiversity is our property was such an obscene idea, such a violent idea. That's when I decided this is what I was going to defend, life in its diversity, by whatever means it, I could seek inspiration from. I said there's only two ways that you can claim to own life, either steal from nature and uh, deny nature's creativity, or steal from cultures that have evolved and come to know that there are trees like the neem, the Azadirichta indica, which are tremendous for controlling pests, uh, or the seeds that the farmers have evolved. India used to have 200,000 rice varieties. And uh, we named this process of appropriation and new colonization biopiracy. We knew this would happen but it actually started to happen. 1994 was the first biopiracy patent I came across. In 1984, I'd started a campaign called No More Bhopal's Plant a Neem, because in India, in a city called Bhopal, we'd had a leak from a pesticide plant owned by Union Carbide on 2nd of December. And that night, the gas leak killed 3,000 people, and the toxic damage has killed 30,000. And I said, but we don't need these killer weapons in agriculture when we have things like neem to control pests without any damage. Ten years later, I find a company called Grace has taken a patent along with the U.S. Department of Agriculture to say we are the inventors of neem. I said, was my grandmother sleeping? <laughs> was my mother who used neem in our clothing and our uh, grain bins not having the knowledge that this is wonderful? Did the farmers who'd been using this not have that knowledge? So I decided to challenge that patent, built a huge campaign, collected 100,000 signatures of peasants, of traditional medicine people, of uh, activists, and uh, took those signatures to the European Patent Office, joined with two other women, the head of the Greens of Europe and the head of the International Organic Movement, and we challenged the biggest superpower and one of the biggest chemical companies. It took us 11 years, but we won that case. And then we had in 98, the case of the patenting of Basmati. Now Basmati means the queen of aroma. Um, it's a rice my valley, Dune Valley, is very famous for. The Aradhuni Basmati is the highest quality Basmati. And a Texas company called Rice Tech, and they think you add tech behind a name and suddenly you're the inventor. They claim to have invented the rice, the plant, the aroma, the cooking of rice, everything. We took that challenge on. Uh, in this case, I fought it through the Supreme Court of India and through a movement in the U.S. against the U.S. Patent Office. And we told the U.S. Patent Office, if you don't revoke this patent and strike it down, we will have to rename you the U.S. Piracy and Theft Office, because it's called the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And it worked and they struck down most claims. And then a little later, we find an ancient Indian wheat has been patented by Monsanto. Um, Indian wheats have very low gluten. Most Westerners now have gluten allergy because the wheat has been so super bred for mechanical baking, for industrial produ production, and all of that has led to increase of the gluten co content leading to allergies. So Monsanto said, wonderful market, all of the gluten allergy people. Um, we can sell biscuits too, everything. So they patented the wheat plant, its low gluten content, dough made from it, biscuits frame from, made from it, any product made from it. And we challenged that too and had that patent revoked. Um, there are two other groups and clusters of mega, mega, mega biopiracy cases right now. Uh, 
One is the appropriation of all the Indian medicine. We started to track and we found 9,000 patterns on everything you, we use in our daily life. And then because of climate change, there is a grabbing of climate resilient crops farmers have bred. If you go to Rajasthan, the desert area, or any other part of India, farmers have very strong drought tolerant varieties. Now the companies are taking patents on drought tolerance. Our coastline has had wonderful salt tolerant rices. And when we had the Orissa cyclone in the 90s, we saved these rices and distributed them so farmers could do agriculture again because a cyclone means water comes from the sea and your land is turned salty. And then you can't do agriculture. But if you have salt tolerant rices, you can. And our farmers who grew these rices then donated two trucks of seed to the tsunami victims in Tamil Nadu who could then bounce back to do agriculture. And now the companies are claiming we have invented salt tolerance. We have beautiful rices that grow 18 feet tall in the floodwaters of the Ganges. And uh, flood tolerance is another thing they're patenting. So climate resilience, they claim, is their invention. And as if they're doing it through genetic engineering, they're doing it just through piracy. And that has been an old way of colonization. The pattern of growth that has been defined as growth to create the capital accumulation that has been typical of our times has failed in the countries where it was created. It would be not very smart to imagine that a model that failed in the countries of its birth would suddenly succeed in countries where it had been transported in terms of sustainability. Yes, for a few years in a highly unstable world, we will see that as the West declines economically, um, and you are seeing Europe come begging to China for a bailout for the Euro, uh, because countries like China have such huge surpluses, uh, they will play a financial economic role of power at the international level. And in that sense, the unequal power of the North dominating the South, the West dominating the East, will be changed a little. But because the model is based on inequity, essentially, and non-sustainability in a very intrinsic way. These countries, China and India, by over-exploiting their resources and creating massive dispossession of their people, will create both ecological and economic and political instability domestically. So, and we are already seeing that. India and China, as more important players internationally, G20, BRIC countries, all of that, and yet within thousands of revolts, 100,000 land protests in China every year. In India, I would say a similar amount. Now, if one third of India is not governed by the rising state, and those areas are expanding, because the process through which you've created this growth is so unjust, that people are rebelling. And beyond a point, military force can't control that kind of rebellion. And definitely beyond a point, an artificial 9% growth can't bring back your rivers, can't bring back your food. So if you look at India today, high growth rate, but the capital of hunger, every fourth Indian is hungry, every second child in India is wasted, which basically means half of India's future has been written off. So our water is disappearing, land is disappearing, the very sustenance base that has kept the civilization going 
and India and China are two of the longest surviving civilizations of the world. The other historical civilizations are gone. If we've survived, it's because of two things. One, we respected the earth. We used very little and we knew how to define a good life without defining it as the exploitation of the earth. Today, we are being told, you foot the bill, the environmental bill. And that is causing a huge burden on both India's resources, our people, and the growth, in my view, is a negative growth if you take into account what people have lost and what nature has lost. After all, what is climate change but self-destruct of the civilization? What is species extinction, water exhaustion, toxic pollution, but self-destruct of the civilization? We're seeing it in front of our eyes. And as far as bodily comforts is concerned, all these claims, oh, we'll produce more food through toxic chemicals, oh, we'll do genetic engineering and have more food. What do we have? A billion people hungry and two billion obese. An obese person is not bodily comfortable. A hungry person is not bodily comfortable. Look at shelter, look at the number of homeless people. No society of the world has had homelessness. You pick a bit of straw, pick a bit of bamboos, maybe some stones, you've got your little hut. Look at the homelessness in America today. Look at the street dwellers in, in India. Everything which claimed to provide a home has created homelessness, which claimed to provide food has created hunger, which claimed to provide em un employment has created unemployment. So it's a material failure, and of course it's a spiritual failure. And the reason, this inability to think of our spiritual evolution, and therefore to go for very, very narrow growth, which fails, is two things. One, it's based on greed, the greed of those who push it, and the greed they take trigger in those who consume it. They need a consumer society to push all these useless products, this toxic plastic culture. And people think they're living better by getting three trashy dresses or five bad shoes that give way in five days compared to nice, strong shoes that a, a good leather craftsman can make for you that can go on for 10 years. Um, or saris here, I mean, these hand-woven saris are timeless. Some of them are from my mother's time. They never f go out of fashion. They never have the kind of giveaway. Um, clothing, you have to be in fashion. If it's purple this year, how can you wear orange? And so obsolescence is bred into our very way of thinking. And we just turn into dumb, stupid consumers becoming part of it. And that's how the society is able to numb our spiritual dimensions. The second thing is that globalization actually turned greed and competition into human creeds. Competition is written into the World Trade Organization rules and greed is written into the mechanisms of making profits at any cost, which is what corporations exist for and putting the corporations and their logic up there, humanity down there, making profiteering and greed a higher value than sharing, conserving, evolving, growing spiritually, individually, as well as societally. That has basically meant that what we have created are truncated human beings. Truncated human beings who are not happy, who are miserable, and that's why look at the amount of Prozac being used to keep this high growth economy going. Um, we'll just have to find our ways. If we look at the world today, uh, basically what we see is 
a recent trend, a few hundred years old, where the world was shaped into a masculine project. Very consciously, knowledge was redefined as masculine by people like Bacon, Francis Bacon. Economy was redefined in terms of that which can be traded and commercially profited from is economy. If you cook food for your children, if you get water for your home, if you look after an old parent, that's not work. It's not productive. It's not contributing to the economy. It's when you buy what you need and sell what you produce, then growth takes place. Um, so on the one hand, we got in science a very mechanistic, reductionist, dominant form of knowledge. And in economy, this idea that production begins with the market and for the market, which erased totally nature's intelligence and her tremendous creative force in pollination, in managing the hydrological cycle, in renewing soil fertility, no matter where you look, so much work is going on, bees buzzing, water moving, droplets going from the Indian Ocean as a little drop in Portugal. Um, all of this amazing creativity, production, reproduction, regeneration, erased. And women who are the biggest workforce on the planet, the biggest productive force on the planet, the biggest contributors to care on the planet, their work was suddenly not work. Women don't work. Um, what women bring to the multiple crises we face as a result of that narrow mechanistic thought and this highly alienated artificial economic system which began with making capital real and reality unreal, which began with giving corporations personhood and made real people non-persons. That whole process is now reaching its maturity. And the economic collapse we see all over the place is one result of it. Ecological collapse, climate catastrophes, species extinctions between three to 300 species disappearing per day. Um, man himself has become the biggest force on the planet. But under this capitalist, patriarchal mode, he's become a destructive force. Women want to be a force but a creative force, a peaceful force, a non-violent force. And what they bring is other ways of knowing that were subjugated, ecological, holistic, relational, and their kind of knowledge is now being totally validated by the best of science. All the work I did in quantum theory when my life as a physicist was still active was about non-locality, non-separability. You can't chop up the world into pieces. All the work that women have done on an economics of care is now having to come real. Either you'll have 80% unemployment under a finance-centered, corporate-centered economy, or you say, no, that's not the economy. The economy is maintaining life on Earth, ensuring we take care of all species on the planet. We protect the resources of this very generous earth who will provide us forever as long as we see ourselves as part of her. And most importantly, we need an economics of cooperation between people. This competition is killing us. And competition, again, comes out of that militarized, masculinist thinking, which has been a short-term distortion in our sense of what it means to be human. Violence is not a human indicator. It's an indicator of our inhumanity. Greed and accumulation is not a measure of our humanity. Sharing and caring is. And those are the values women are bringing in a different way to shape a world other than that, shaped by the convergence of patriarchy with capitalism. Mm. 
やっと。One of the things I have learned is to spend a lot of energy working with people, their goodness, creating solidarity, and of course, the miracle at every point of life unfolding daily. Life where you can trample on grass and it bounces back, where you can. Put a seed into the soil and it sprouts out. That miracle is such a powerful inspiration to me, and the beauty that it brings with it—the beauty in people, the beauty in the rugged face of a peasant woman who has pride in her forest, water, her seed, and a determination that this is my life and I won't let go. And of course, knowing how bad things are is part of what my head analyzes. And I always say, you know, given that I had an education in English, a degrees in physics, I know how to speak English, the language of domination, and I know how to add numbers, another language of domination, and so I don't get dominated, and I'm able to deal with the lies. I can, you know, add two and two, and it should be four, and I won't create twenty out of it. And once Monsanto does, I can take them on.、Um, I do it also by not taking myself too seriously, knowing that I'm a little speck, and it is my duty to do certain things. As our Gita, our beautiful, beautiful text says, you've got to engage in the right action. It is not yours to determine its outcome, and so that detachment with engagement, the ability to pour yourself passionately into an issue, and yet remove yourself dispassionately. In terms of what happens to it,、um, has helped me deal with some of the most ferocious powers of our times.、Um, my parents taught me never to be fearless. They said, "Follow your conscience. You'll never have to be afraid." I look at the future, and I look at it in my very quantum theoretical way. That's highly uncertain. There are two possibilities: the possibility of carrying on on the path that we are, with crazy scientists wanting to do geoengineering. They first mess up the planet with climate change, and they say, "Now we'll fix it." And the resource grab and land grab attached with all of that、uh, can pu- push us, put us on a fast forward to extinction. In which case, I'm confident that the Earth will carry on. We, as a species, will go. But because in India we believe in reincarnation, human species extinction is not the end of life. We're just one. The worms and microbes and everything else is one of us. And the second option is a rapid change in consciousness, a rapid change in who we are. Now that is a majority shift, because most women. Don't believe in this grabbing. They don't have the opportunity anyway. Most of the disenfranchised, ninety-five nine percent, are shaping another world. Want another world? They want non-violence. They want sharing. They want other ways of political organizing, economic organizing, and that tectonic shift that's taking place is under the Papimer pyramid, shifting the base. And when change happens. Very rapidly, we could be in another place as a species.、Um, our age has been called the Anthropocene age, where humanity has been such a destructive force on the planet. Its climate is decided by our actions. Our, the species are, is decided by action. The state of water is decided by our action. The fertility of soils is decided by action. We can carry on there, and then we don't exist. Or we can change it to the creative Anthropocene. Energized by a feminine energy, the energy of non-Western、uh, spiritual civilizations, the energy of ind- ind- indigenous people, the energy of the Earth herself and her diversity, to basically recognize that we are one interwoven life, and we can continue to have a future if we just recognize that one simple fact: that we are not 
owners, conquerors, dominators of the earth, but part of the earth.